הים הוא שקט, פתאום הוא סוער, שמש גדולה ולילה קודם. יש אהבות ויש מלחמות, פעם זה כך ופעם זה כך ושוב אמין. עכשיו אתה כל כך צעיר, אולי אתה עוד לא יודע שיש עצב בעולם ויש גם ילד רעב ומיותר Shalom. Thank you for joining us. Our Jewish National Fund San Diego Virtual Tu Bishvat Gardening Workshop and Celebration is now beginning. Thank you for joining us today with our many community partners as we come together to celebrate Tu Bishvat, the New Year of the Trees. To ensure an optimal virtual experience for those on computers, we recommend you view the program on speaker view. This option is located at the top right-hand corner of your desktop screen. All participants are now muted. If you have a question during the program, please use the chat feature on the bottom of your Zoom screen to send a chat to Monica Edelman. Your question will be answered shortly after you've submitted it, or it will be asked during the Q&A towards the end of the program. Ladies and gentlemen, to begin our program, it is an honor to welcome a fellow San Diegan who has supported Israel and Jewish National Fund for decades. He currently serves as national president of Jewish National Fund and has led our organization from strength to strength. He is chairman and co-founder of 4C Medical Inc. and has been a pioneer in the healthcare industry for over 40 years. Throughout his illustrious career, he has received distinguished awards and appointments, including healthcare advisor to California Governor Jerry Brown, trustee of the US Olympic Committee and the University of California, San Diego, and many more. He was also the recipient of a California state resolution recognizing his contribution to healthcare and is a winner of the Ernst & Young's Entrepreneur of the Year Award for Healthcare. Please welcome Jewish National Fund USA's president and fellow San Diegan, Dr. Saul Wizerbram. Thank you, Monica. Welcome to our Jewish National Fund San Diego Tu B'Shvat Community Celebration and Gardening Workshop. Living in San Diego, my wife Lauren and I are so glad to see so many people from our San Diego Jewish community here today to celebrate Tu B'Shvat together. Tu B'Shvat is synonymous with Jewish National Fund because we are the organization that has planted over 250 million trees throughout the land of Israel, making Israel one of the only two countries in the world that has entered the 21st century with a net gain in its number of trees. But Jewish National Fund doesn't only plant seeds in the ground to grow trees, we do so much more. JNF is fulfilling Ben-Gurion's dream of populating the Negev. We are attracting hundreds of thousands of people to the north and south, young couples that cannot afford housing in the Tel Aviv area. To do this, we have created jobs, built schools, hospitals, fire stations, and playgrounds. We even have a housing fund for young couples to buy a house. We're in the midst of a $1 billion campaign to build projects in Israel for Jewish education here in the United States, as well as great things in, in, without, throughout Israel. This has never been done before in Jewish philanthropy. And I'm proud to announce that we're at $740 million towards the $1 billion goal. Even though 2020 was a difficult year for all of us, JNF did not slow down. A few things we did during COVID sent hundreds of teens in September on our semester abroad high school in Israel program and started a college gap year program to help forge their lifelong connection 
to our ancestral soil. We brought Israeli small businesses into American homes through our online mitzvah marketplace. We started virtual tours to Israel on a virtual bus right here in San Diego with live licensed guides in Israel. For people, 25 people per bus, we thought maybe in San Diego we'd have two, maybe three buses. But as of date, we've taken over 5,100 people virtually to Israel during COVID. We provided life-saving equipment to Israel's firefighters as they battled hundreds of fires in the North and South. We supported homebound elderly residents and Holocaust survivors in Israel through the provision of food and medical supplies. We provided laptops to children in Israel with disabilities so they could continue to receive therapy online at home. As if that isn't enough, we're building a 21 acre international village in Israel for Israel education in the south of Israel in Be'er Sheva with a park three times the size of Central Park. There's so much more, like building a world-class culinary institute, a four-year school in the north of Israel with top chefs from around the world. Well, I could go on and on, but we have a great program for you today. Thank you for your participation and your support of Jewish National Fund. And with that, I'm honored to turn the mic over to Jewish National Fund, San Diego president, the queen of spices, and my friend, Debbie Kornberg. Thank you, Saul. Thank you so much for sharing about the amazing projects JNF does to support the land and people of Israel. Hi, everyone. I am so excited that we are hosting JNF's very first community-wide Tu B'Shvat celebration right here in San Diego. And thanks to the technology and the amazing JNF staff, we are able to welcome people from all over San Diego, the United States, and Israel. I am so proud to say we have 20 partnering organizations from San Diego County representing our strong and vibrant Jewish community. Thank you to all of the synagogues and organizations who said yes to this brand new idea and are here today partnering with Jewish National Fund. So the idea of creating a community-wide Tu B'Shvat program came from a place of just wanting to gather as a community. Even if it meant virtually, being able to celebrate this beautiful holiday of Tu B'Shvat, it's one of my personal favorites right up there with Passover. And I have to tell you, ever since I can remember from my early days in Hebrew school, I would see those little blue boxes sitting on my teacher's desk and anticipate the annual JNF Tu B'Shvat poster that would come out at this time of year and be hung on my classroom wall. That is such a strong and powerful memory for me. This simple holiday of celebrating the Jewish New Year of the Trees has evolved to mean so much more than its biblical intention of not just eating forbidden fruit of a young tree for its first three years. Over the centuries, both Sephardic and Ashkenazi traditions have created new customs and pathways, allowing for this holiday to continue to be relevant and meaningful. So today, in this COVID world we are living in, when we are not able to travel to Israel, visit a synagogue or organization whenever we feel like it, or even see friends, we are forced to create new and relevant customs to celebrate and gather as a community. I hope today's program will give you the opportunity to feel closer to the Jewish community and to the people who are sitting on either side of you. Let us recognize those blessings we do have around us. Let us give thanks for the beautiful world surrounding us. Let Tu B'Shvat be a reminder of hope and renewal when we see those first buds of growth coming from a dormant plant. So let us plant new beginnings, both physically and spiritually together. And now let's get that taste of Israel Consider it our booster shot, our Israel booster shot. It is my honor to introduce an extraordinary leader. She is a unique visionary who is working with JNF to build the land and people of Israel for its future generations. 
She is a seasoned professional whose skilled leadership has enabled communities in the Negev Central Arava region to flourish and grow. She is a proud Sabra who works with her husband to make Israel's desert bloom and they're on their pepper farm. So passionate, she made the active choice to leave the center of Israel while pregnant to live in the Negev. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome the Central Arava Regional Council's Director of Resource Development, Noah Zair. Happy to be Shvat to all San Diego friends of Israel. My name is Noah Zair and I'm speaking to you from the Arava in Israel. The Arava is located deep down in the desert area of Israel halfway between Elat and Beersheba, right along the Jordanian border. This is one of the most extreme and isolated places in Israel with multiple challenges. This region is not connected to the main water grid of Israel. It's one of the driest places on earth with a temperature that can get up to 120 during the summertime. And uh, this is a place where not a lot of people live in, only 4,000 residents, 1,000 families in really one of the most challenging places. But regardless of that challenges and the fact that this region gets only maybe one inch of rain every year, the Arava is leading Israel's world-renowned agricultural industry producing more than 50% of Israel fresh vegetable export. That's right, more than half the vegetables Israel is exporting abroad comes from a place with no water. You know why? It's a combination of faith, chutzpah, and a lot of knowledge. Here in the Arava for more than 50 years, we are generating knowledge of how to grow sustainable agriculture in multi-arid regions. We grow food, from scratch with no resources. And this knowledge is valued not just for the community here in the Arava, but for lots of other countries who are facing droughts, famine, and other challenges caused by climate changes. It is ever so true today when we are dealing with the COVID crisis that uh, demands us to create more food for more people as the planet resources diluting, but the exponential number of the population is growing rapidly. So the Arava, though being a small place with its 600 farms is generating valuable knowledge so every farmer can have the tools to change the lives of their community. And we are sharing that knowledge with other nations and with other people from developing countries all around the world. Our small community uh, has been uh, greatly supported by the Jewish National Fund for many years, understanding the great mission of making the desert bloom, living along the border and making sure that we will be able to carry on that important mission of growing the fruits and vegetables and feeding the people in Israel. Uh, JNF is involved in multiple projects here and I would like to say that in a way, since we're celebrating Tubi Shabbat, for us, JNF is sowing seeds of success, seeds of quality of life, seeds of security, and seeds of change all over the Arava, with projects like building medical centers, kindergartens, improving the life quality of people here, supporting the cutting edge science that enable us to do our important work those are all uh, the results of the hard work and cultivation of the farmers and the community here together with the support of the Jewish National Fund. Um, here in the Alva, most of the population, as I told you, are farmers. So for us, for us every day is to be Shvat, as we are planting thousands and th hundreds of thousands of seeds every day. Uh, in this desert land, we are growing a variety of fruits and vegetables from bell peppers to tomatoes, cherry tomatoes, zucchinis, eggplants, grapes, dates, and everything in between. Our fruits and vegetables are the sweetest in the world, and that's a scientific fact. That the water that we have here comes from local water wells, which are brackish and salty, and the salt drives the fruits and vegetables to be very, very sweet. 
So as you can understand, the spirit of the pioneers and the people who live here is not to look at the disadvantages, but only look at the advantages and find innovative ways to fight with the desert and to make the desert bloom. Um, I want to wish you all for two Bishvat that may this year be a blossoming year, that the seeds that we are planting now of solidarity, of uh, humanity will blossom and grow. And God's willing, we hope to see all of you in Israel next year and see for yourself how we can make the country bloom and we can make the desert bloom. So thank you and looking forward to seeing you in Israel. Tu Bishvat Sameach. Thank you, Noah, for sharing all the amazing work you do to ensure the Aravaz Negev continues to thrive and bloom. In wanting the community event to have a feeling of intimacy today, we created an opportunity for people to gather in smaller groups, allowing us for deeper interaction with one another. It is our hope that with our amazing community rabbis and educators facilitating a Tubishvat discussion, that it would give us the kavanah, the intention, and provide us meaning and purpose for when we have an opportunity in just a little bit to each do our own planting. In just a few moments, you will be broken up into your pre-assigned breakout rooms. These, there will be a prompt popping up on your screen to take you to your breakout room. You will be invited to be in the room of the community organization that you registered with. If for any reason you are not able to join a room, you will stay here in the main room with me and Rabbi Kornberg. We will see you back in about 15 minutes after the breakout rooms. I did mention earlier that this was an opportunity to give thanks. In Judaism, when we give thanks, we often do it through prayer and praise. Let us give thanks for the opportunity to study Torah. I will recite the blessing for studying Torah. If you know it, please join in with me. And if you don't, please feel free to say amen at the end. Baruch ata Adonai Eloheinu melech haolam asher kiddushanu b'mitzvotav v'tzivanu la'asok b'divrei Torah. Blessed are you, Adonai our God, sovereign of all, who hallows us with mitzvot commanding us to engage with words of Torah. We'll see you soon. Rabbi Kornberg, are you here? If you're here, feel free to unmute yourself. I know he was running from behind camera to in front of camera. There we go, now I can unmute. Can you hear me now? Yes. Awesome. Awesome. Well, welcome everyone. I'm going to give just another second or two for everyone to find their uh, their breakout room, and then we'll have an opportunity of uh, learning a little bit of Torah together. Um, for me, the opportunity to celebrate a, a holiday is uh, is celebrated for me by the opportunity to learn something new, and um, I'm going to share a couple of sources. But once again. Uh, everyone should be going to their
particular rooms. I still see people popping in and out. So I'm just gonna give another minute for everyone to get to their appropriate rooms. And if you feel that you're supposed to be in a different room, if you're on a computer, you can go to the bottom of your screen where it says breakout rooms and you should be able to self-select which breakout room you'd like to go to. Otherwise, feel free to stay here. <laughs> All right, so I'm going to share my screen with everyone. And, um, you know, we've, we've had the opportunity over the years of learning uh, a lot of different sources about Tubi Shabbat, about trees, but I wanted to come at it from a very particular perspective today. And um, as you see the screen that I'm, that I'm sharing with you, I wanna talk about our tradition's use of the image of the tree as representing things that are beautiful and good in the world. You know, I think we naturally sort of find ourselves, we look at a beautiful tree and we go, Ah, but there's something to that. There's something to that. And our tradition picks up on that. And our tradition in a number of different times throughout uh, our history utilizes this idea of a tree or sometimes the idea of a garden, the idea of a garden to represent a paradigm of everything that is beautiful and everything that is great or everything that it could be in this world. And that's kind of what I wanna look at today. And we're gonna look at three sources. And for those who study with me uh, regularly, you know that I tend, I like to do things chronologically, although this time I didn't. This time I did it thematically. We're gonna take a source from, uh, I think the 1700s first, then we're gonna go back to the Talmud and then come back to the 1800s as we go. So let's take a look at our first source. The first source comes from a text called Misilat Yesharim, or the Path of the Just. It was written in 1738 by Rabbi Moshe Chaim Lutzato. And it reads as follows. Our sages roused us to this fundamental principle in Midrash Kohelet saying, see the work of God. That is the verse that the Midrash is quoting. See the work of God. Now, how does it explain that? When the Holy One, blessed be God, created Adam, God took him and led him to pass before all of the trees in the Garden of Eden and said to them, see how beautiful and excellent are my works. Let's think about that for a moment, right? That God is leading Adam and wanting to show the majesty of all of creation, everything God could have chosen. And God chooses the trees. See how beautiful and how excellent are my works. All that I've created, I've created for your sake. Be careful that you do not become corrupt and destroy my world. So we have both the the blessing and the warning, right, from God in this, in this particular text of, yes, I've created everything for you. Look how beautiful it is, but you better be careful because we human beings, we have the ability to corrupt it, to destroy it, if we are not careful. So that's the first source that I want us to kind of hold in our minds, an example of God at the very beginning of creation saying to Adam, I want to show you the best of my best. I mean, think about it this way, you know, you're, you're in an art gallery, you're an artist, and you're showing around where you're going to show the prospective buyer to, to that, you know, to your, to your best painting, to your best work. Uh, that's where you want to show them first to really understand you. And that's in the trees. Any questions or comments on this? We're going to leave time at the end for, for discussion. But if there's a, just a clarification question, I'm happy to answer it. All right, so the second source comes from the Babylonian Talmud. It's a little bit of a longer source. I'll read through it relatively quickly. Babylonian Talmud was finished around the year 500 CE. And this comes from Masechet Ta'anit, from the, the section actually that deals, interestingly enough, with rain through the idea of fasting. Um, Ta'anit means fasts, and it doesn't really talk about Yom Kippur, and it doesn't talk about the other major fasts in that sort of way. These are the fasts that were called when there was a drought. And in the ancient times, people felt like if there was a drought, it's because we've done something wrong. We take that from the second paragraph of the Shema. And so they would call a fast and they would reflect and think about that. And so it has to do very often with rain and with water. Um, 
And here's the story that we find in Masachet Tani. When they were taking leave of one another, Rav Nachman said to Rabbi Yitzchak, Master, give me a blessing. Rabbi Yitzchak said to him, I will tell you a parable. I guess that's a, a version of a blessing, right? To what is this matter comparable? It's comparable to one who was walking through a desert, who was hungry and tired and thirsty, and he found a tree whose fruits were sweet and whose shade was pleasant, and a stream of water flowed beneath it. And he ate from the fruits of the tree and drank from the water of the stream, and he sat in the shade of the tree. And when he wished to leave, he said, tree, tree, with what shall I bless you? If I say to you, your fruits should be sweet, your fruits are already sweet. If I say to you that your shade should be pleasant, your shade is already pleasant. If I say that a stream of water should flow beneath you, a stream of water already flows beneath you. Rather, I will bless you as follows. May it be God's will that all saplings which they plant from you be just like you. Now, I love this particular source for a lot of different reasons. Um, it, it, it brings along the best of, of Talmud for me. It, it's a story, but it teaches value, val valuable lessons. Um, and as I see this in our discussion, here we have an example of a human being wanting to find a way to bless a tree. And there's two pieces to it. The first is a recognition of all of the gifts that a tree actually already has, the magnificence of the tree. It already has sweet fruit and it already has pleasant shade and it's already there if it's, if it's a deep rooted tree, you know, with a stream of water to nourish it and all those sorts of things. So what is the blessing that we human beings can, can offer for a tree? That its saplings be just like them. And for me, that's an example, obviously, when we think about our own desires for our children and for the generations to come. Yet again, it's the exemplar of a tree that's perfection. That's what we are striving to. Of all that is good and beautiful, just like a tree's saplings look like them, act like them, grow like them, so too do we want our children to take up the values that we have, find themselves a good stream to nurture, to nurture them and to give them the water that they need and grow deep roots just like the trees that, that come before them. Again, I find this to be a really amazing source when we come and looking at a tree. And, and I'm trying to find sources that we haven't necessarily learned before and we, we haven't seen before. It's an unusual source and I think it's a very powerful one. Questions for clarification on, on this one? All right. So the last one comes from Likutei Mohran, which is uh, a text that it comes from the teachings of Rav Nachman of Bratslav. This particular work was completed in the year 1808. And this is a, a, a pretty straightforward text on the surface, simple, but I think very, very deep. No, there is a field where very beautiful and pleasing trees and plants grow. It is impossible to describe the precious beauty of this field and its produce. Happy is the eye that has seen it. These trees and plants are the holy souls that grow in this field. So now we've got a source that is taking the trees and connecting it with our very souls, the souls of human beings. And the grove of these souls, the grove of all of our souls, is such a beautiful orchard. It's such a beautiful place that we can't even describe it. It's the ultimate of beauty. It's the ultimate of majesty. And it's our own very souls. So we've got three different sources here that use the image of a tree to show the, 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 the magnificence and the excellence in the world that is around us. And I think that as we get ready to plant, and although we're planting succulents today and smaller trees, as we think about planting trees, this is something that when JNF plants trees, it's not just about the nature. It's not just about um, the politics. It's not just about the future. It's about the magnificence of what Israel can be. 
that's built into this image of these trees. And it's so amazing and so wonderful. So I'm going to uh, open it up and, and let people comment or ask questions at this point in time. Um, I had a little challenge um, unmuting myself. It said that I still couldn't unmute. So you may, one of the co-hosts may have to help people uh, do that. Uh, and I've stepped off my co-host page. So just make sure that people are able to unmute from the security section. They can, and, they can. Okay, thank you, Gary. And any questions or comments that people have, I would love to hear them. Oh, I know the people on this on this call. There's more. There's there's more talkative people than that. All right. Well, if we're not going to ask a question, then I have. Oh, I saw somebody raise their hand. Marilyn, please go ahead. And, well, you have to unmute yourself. There you go. Thank you. I just want to say thank you for this lovely program and all the services that Beth Am is doing for us while we're at home. Thank you. Well, we're so happy that we could be part of this of this more global program. I mean, you know, we've each of the each of the organizations has done a lot to try and, and do things for for their people. But it's nice to remember that there's a larger community out there. And it's nice to be able to get together with JNF and to be able to to sort of realize and remember what an amazing larger community that we have. And we've got all different denominations here and all different backgrounds and everyone's learning together and everyone's planning together and talk about perfection of a community, right? Exactly. Talk about what we're trying to, <laughs> we're trying to achieve. So thank you, Marilyn. Yeah, so you took um, lemons and made lemonade out of all this. For sure. Yes, For from, sure the tree, from the yes, lemon tree. <laughs> <laughs> um, any other questions or comments on these? So let me ask a question. I want you all to think for a moment, and you don't have to answer if you don't, if you don't want to, you know, but I want you to think for a moment about an image of a tree. Not a random tree, not a made up tree, but an image of a moment in your life that in which there were trees around or a particular tree around. I want you to think about how you felt at that moment. And I want you to think about the connection that we make with that tree in terms of that feeling. Because we're gonna be planting in a little bit. And part of what Debbie was saying is, you know, for a mitzvah and, and planting a tree is a mitzvah. For a mitzvah, we need to have a kavanah, we need to have an intention. And I want you to see if you can take that emotion that you have and that connection and use that as the kavanah for our planting for today. Um, Rabbi, I, I have a comment. Please, Nancy. Uh, well, as you can see from my virtual background, the Tory pine trees is my favorite tree. Mm -hmm. And um, I feel really blessed and grateful to have um, the Tory Pine State Park in our backyard, and so to speak. And uh, walking there has always been, walking in, in Torrey Pines has always been one of my favorite activities, um, not only for the peace and uh, feeling of connection with nature, but also as a training ground for hikes and things like that. So um, the, uh, and the Torrey Pine tree is also really unique because there's only two places in the whole world where they exist here in San Diego and then the uh, Santa Rosa Island and the Channel Islands. And so that to me makes it, you know, really, really special. Thank you, Nancy. Really appreciate that. Myra, I see your hand up. Hi, it's nice to see you virtually, everybody. <laughs> and you too, Rabbi. Um, what I wanted to say is that I have planted trees in Israel many times. I've planted things in my own garden. Um, when I've planted trees in Israel, uh, it, it with JNF especially, I feel it's almost like there's a spiritual feeling. Um, when you said visualize a tree, I 
took a moment and I thought back to the last time I planted a tree in Israel with JNF and the feeling of holding that little sapling in my hand and how special that felt and getting my hands dirty and my hands uh, in the ground there in Israel in the soil and how spiritual it was and how meaningful it was. That was what my brain went to when you, when you just asked that question. Nice, Myra, I love that. I love that. And I think many of us have had that opportunity. And one of the things that we do often is we put an intentionality with that moment and we often will plant it in honor some, of somebody or in memory of somebody and make that connection even deeper and stronger. So awesome, Myra. Sabrina. Hi, um, nice to see you. And to be Shvach Samer. The tree that automatically came to my mind, um, there were two. One is the magnolia tree and one is uh, the queen palm, both of which Mark um, gave me as gifts. Um, one in Toronto when we were there and uh, the queen palm is here in my backyard. So every time I see a, a magnolia tree or the, the queen palm in my backyard, it just brings back really lovely memories and uh, makes me smile. Awesome, awesome. Lauren, I'll give you uh, the last word and then we're gonna, and then we're gonna wrap up. Okay, um, interesting. Last week I had my peach tree which last year had thousands of peaches in two weeks. I just had it grafted so that we will have different varieties for a hopefully for a longer period of time. And, you know, the fact that the fruit trees sustain us, you know, we cook with the lemons from the lemon tree and the blood orange tree. And, you know, it's just a matter of substance for us. It's amazing that, you know, these trees are, so part of our lives. So that's my sharing. Well, thank you. Um, and I see people are coming back into our main group. So welcome back everyone who has rejoined us. And I'm now going to give it over to, uh, to Jackie Schneider, um, who is going to be taking over from this point in time. Well, welcome back and thank you. I hope you all enjoyed learning about To Be Shot with our San Diego rabbis and educators. My name is Jackie Schneider, and I'm a proud member of JNF's Women for Israel Sapphire Society and the Arts and Entertainment Task Force. Now that we are all in the To Be Shvat spirit, it's my honor to introduce our garden expert extraordinaire, who has generously donated her time and talent to make this program possible. She is a garden designer, author, botanist, an award-winning garden communicator dedicated to sharing the magic of climate appropriate and sustainable gardening. She is host, co-producer, and co-writer of A Growing Passion, a television show that celebrates all the ways that San Diego grows from farms and nurseries to backyards and schoolyards to native habitats and more. Please join me in welcoming the one and only Nan Sturman. Hello everybody, I am so pleased to be here. I'm in the Kornberg's kitchen, which is their studio. It's a lovely place to be. I've been here many times. It's a place that I really enjoy being and hopefully I'm in your kitchen family room, wherever you're watching too. It's really an honor to talk with you on to Bishvat, the, the holiday of the trees, which is one of my favorite holidays. And I also wanna point out that trees have another purpose in our lives. Trees are one of the most important tools in battling climate change. So I want to encourage you to continue planting trees in your backyard through JNF and around the world. Today, what we're going to do is I'm going to do a demonstration on planting succulents, succulent bowls for succulent centerpieces. You all should have gotten a list of supplies so you can follow along. And also, if you look in the chat, there is a link to a download for the step-by-step -step directions for doing what I'm doing. So I'm gonna start out talking about what succulents are. If you haven't downloaded that yet, please do so. So succulents are a really interesting group of plants. Now, um, people normally assume that succulents are one kind of plant, that they all are related and succulents are not all related. Succulents is actually an adaptation for plants that grow in very dry areas, areas where water is available periodically and then not for a long time. 
So over time, these plants have evolved so that they can accumulate water. They take up water and they store it in their leaves, in their stems, in their roots when there's water there. And then in those long dry periods, they use that water to continue living until the rains come again. And by the way, if you saw Noah Zero's video about um, the farms that uh, she is involved in in Arava, I was shocked when she said that they have a rainfall of an inch maybe every year. Here in San Diego, where we're really dry, our rainfall is twice, uh, sorry, 10 times that. So that is really significant, one inch of rainfall, that's all. So um, what, the, what we're gonna do is I'm gonna walk you through the process. And the idea is to plant a succulent container that you can use indoors or outdoors on your table as a table decoration that you can make as a hostess gift um, that you can enjoy indoors. Succulents are not indoor plants. So these are not going to be plants that you would wanna grow in your house, but rather grow outside and bring them indoors. For those of you who are watching from Massachusetts or Ohio, you know these are plants that you're gonna use seasonally. Whereas here in Southern California, we have these year round. Aren't we lucky? So let's start by talking about containers. Now in your directions, the direction said to get a container about 10 inches long and five to seven inches tall. But in order to have a container that's gonna fit on your table, it, it has to be a small enough size. So I like starting with these kinds of containers. They're very shallow. They're not a tall container. That's because when you use succulents that are these sizes, they don't have deep roots. They're pretty shallow rooted. So if you will put these succulents into a tall pot, they will kind of get lost. And instead we want to celebrate their shapes and their sizes. So we're going to use short containers and um, ones that aren't too big because again, we want them to fit on the table. So I brought a number of examples today and I want to show you just some possibilities. I really enjoyed this one. This is a bowl. It's only about 10 inches across and maybe five or six inches tall. You can go with smaller ones. I'm really fond of these glazed ceramics. This one is an eight inch square. I've done this for Thanksgiving before where I plant these and I always have to start a couple months ahead of time because these are small plants and you don't wanna overcrowd it. You wanna give them a uh, room to grow in and it takes about two months. In fact, if you buy a succulent arrangement in the store, it wasn't planted yesterday. It was planted two months, three months, five months ago. There's some round ones here. This one is plastic. These are really inexpensive, lightweight, and succulents do great in them. And if you're gonna have them outdoors, this is a really good choice. So those are the kinds of options that we have for containers. We always, whenever we do a container, the old style was to put gravel or broken pottery in the bottom. We don't do that anymore. All we do is we take a piece of window screen, and I'll show you this again in a few minutes, and we use this to cover the hole. And um, the only purpose is that the window screens, two purposes, one to hold the potting mix inside so it doesn't run out. And also um, so the water can drain out through that screen. Today, I'm going to plant this one. It's a little heavy. So I'm gonna move the others out of the way so I have enough room. We're gonna, we're gonna focus on this one. And I wanna tell you about using potting mixes. Usually I do this outside on a big table where I'm not worried about making a mess. Here I'm a little bit more concerned. I don't want Debbie it's, or it's okay. Rabbi to be upset with me. <laughs> not that they would, I know. When you go to the nursery to find a potting mix, and by the way, you don't wanna plant these into dirt. You never wanna plant into dirt unless you're planting in the ground. But in a container, you don't ever wanna plant into dirt. We wanna use potting mix. We call it potting mix because there's no dirt in it. And there's lots of different kinds when you go to the nursery to choose from. Because succulents grow dry and they wanna grow dry, you want to use a potting mix that is a cactus and succulent mix specifically. So this is a mix that I use 
for other plants, for non-thirsty plants. You can see it's very brown, it's very finely ground, and it works well for perennials, for house plants, for things like that. It won't work well for succulents because it doesn't have enough drainage. And even when you go look for a succulent mix, they're not all the same. Every brand is gonna be different. This is a succulent mix that I picked up at the nursery. The brown stuff, by the way, it's usually peat or it's ground up um, bark and, and composted tree materials. It smells good, it smells like soil. <laughs> Um, this is a cactus and succulent mix. It's a little finer textured than I like. I don't like it quite this fine textured. So if this were my only choice, I would mix it with, this is perlite and perlite is an expanded material. It feels like styrofoam. And the, the reason you use this is because it's big irregular shaped pieces and they don't pack very tightly together. So you mix it in with the, potting soil, and it creates air spaces so that water drains through. The other material that I would use, and actually my first choice, oh, sorry, that was it. <laughs> this is pumice. This is perlite. Perlite is the one that's more like styrofoam, and that works okay. It's easy to find, but if you can get it, pumice, which is actually a rock material, is much better to use. But the potting mix we're going to use today is a pretty good cactus and succulent mix. This is the EB stone mix. You look at how piecey it is. You, it's brown because of the, the um, I think this one is, is just forest material. By the way, if you ever wanna know what's in a bag of potting mix, look on the label. It always says, there's always an ingredient list. But this one is really grainy, it's really coarse. And that's really what we want. I'm gonna put on my gloves. Now, if I were doing this at home, I would not wear gloves, but since I'm trying to cl stay clean for you all, I will do that. Oops. All right, so we have our pot, we have our potting mix, and then the other things you're gonna need for doing this are pruning shears because you never know when you're gonna need them, a spoon, scissors, that window screen I told you about. Here's another kind of, of uh, little snippers, a trowel, various kinds of containers for mixing and pouring, and then my favorite gardening tool of all, chopsticks. This is truly my favorite gardening tool and you'll see why in a few minutes. Debbie, do you have everything? I do. I have my pot, my screen, of course my chopsticks. Nan gave me these. Thank you, Nan. And I've got my soil. I'm also using the EB soil here and I have a little cup to scoop up. And of course I have my succulents, which I'm really excited about. Right. So let's talk about succulents next. I'm just gonna move this out of the way for the moment. Now, some people choose their plants first, some people choose their pots first, it doesn't matter. But we know we're gonna use this pot today. So the question is, which plants are we gonna use? This is a, a selection of pots. These are two inch, three inch, four inch, those are the sizes that are gonna fit best into this pot. You don't want a whole pot because that's not gonna fit. Though we're still gonna use it and I'll show you how. And when I'm at the nursery, I, I literally sit down on the ground, I pull all the plants out and I sit and I play with combinations before I even buy anything because I wanna know what I'm getting. So I did that before, I, um, before today. And I'm thinking that for this pot, I always think about color combinations. Do I wanna match a room? Am I just looking for something fun? Do I want rainbow colors? Um, is, there, is there some other, am I giving it to somebody and, and they're into a particular color combination? So you wanna think about color. You also think about texture. So this beautiful little succulent has very broad leaves. I wanna match that with something that has fine leaves. 
or something with very tall upright blades. I like this because I like the silver complementing the blue in here and that just little bit of pink on the outside. So that I like, let's see. Nan, Wish. can you mix big and small? You can mix big and small. You wanna make sure that things are um, complementary. Oh, this one came out of its pot. When you do a flower arrangement or when you do a container, most of the time we think about combining three kinds of plants kind of in terms of composition. We think of the, the thriller, which is sort of the focus. Usually it's tall when you're not dealing with succulents. You think about the filler, which goes around it, and you think of the spiller that goes on the outside. So it's, David likes that, thriller, filler, spiller. Succulents, we don't always have exactly those categories, but keep that in mind because it really helps. So I think I'm gonna do, I'm gonna do this combination for this pot. I'll just pull these where I can reach them easily because my arms are not that long. What do you need? Can you hand me those two, Debbie? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Debbie and I have a special two bishvat relationship because many <laughs> years ago on two bishvat, Debbie called me when my children were at the Jewish Academy, and she said, "Will you come volunteer to do a two bishvat activity at the Jewish Academy with the kids?" And I said, "Sure. Where's the garden?" And she said to me, "Garden," <laughs> and that launched us onto a, how many five year odyssey of yes. building a garden at the Jewish Academy, which was 5,000 square foot garden, not yes. just a little garden. No, a big garden. 5,000 yeah. square foot garden, <laughs> humongous. But we yes. did it. We did it. And it's still there. All righty. So I've got my pot. <clears throat> and you notice there's holes in the bottom. There's two holes in the bottom of this pot. I remember I said that we need to use screen to cover the bottom. This is just window screen. You can buy this by the roll. I mean, you probably get enough to last you your whole life. Or if you have an old window screen that's broken, I, whenever I come across an old window screen, I ask if I can have the screen and everybody looks at me like I'm crazy, but you know, that's all right, I'm used to that. So I'm literally just cutting enough screen to cover the holes. Could I cover one big piece to, for the whole bottom? Sure, no problem. but. I'm just going to do two squares. I know this is going to be hard for you to see because the pot is dark, but I'm going to put the, squ the squares over the holes. And then when I set the potting soil inside, I'm going to make sure that the potting soil is heavy enough to seal that on the bottom and nothing will get around it. By the way, it also keeps little critters, slugs and roly polies and things like that from crawling up into the pot. All right, my pot's ready, but I can't just put dry potting mix into that pot. A lot of people do that, but I don't do it that way. The next thing I have to do is wet my potting mix. How are we going to do that? I'll show you one okay. second. All right, I'm ready. You ready? Yeah. Okay. Oh, water. We wet it with, yes, we wet it with water. Oh, <laughs> Debbie, you are so smart. Let me get my bucket. Get your bucket. Can you pick it up? <laughs> yeah, I got it. Debbie's, Debbie's doing what I'm Here's doing. My water. I'm not using the sink. I don't know why, but this is what Nan told me to do. So I follow it would take truck. you forever to fill that bucket and get enough water. So this is a bucket that I have at the ready when we set this up. And this is just a scoop. Being, being the daughter of children of, of the depression, I keep all kinds of things and reuse them. And you, I, you know, it's just how it is. It drives my husband crazy, but so what? He's also the child of depression era children. Okay. So we're gonna wet this. All of it. All of it. All of this. Uh-huh. So that as you get more experience, you get a sense of how much potting soil you're actually gonna need to fill a particular container. I'm probably going to do a couple of these as demonstration if we have enough time. So I'm doing a whole bunch. And the goal here, oh, mix it up. You want to, You can use my trowel if you want. I have gloves. You have gloves? Yeah, I do. Good. I'm yeah. sorry. I, do, I didn't tell you about the gloves. So how do we know when we have enough water in there? I'll show you one minute. Okay. 
I don't want to overdo it because then you have to add more soil. It's That's it. like flour and water. That is exactly right. <laughs> that is exactly right. If you add too much water, then you have a mess and you have to keep adding soil. And I'm using soil euphemistically here. This is potting mix. In the broadest sense of the word. The broadest sense of the word. Just okay. like Torah. It's like what? Torah. Torah in the broadest sense <laughs> you of know, the word. Study, learn. It's not always out of the humash. It's the broadest sense of the term of learning. All right. <laughs> so here's the answer. You see how this holds together? Yeah. It's like when you make matzo balls <laughs> or hamburgers. Okay. You want enough liquid that it holds together and not so much that it drips, okay. right? When I squeeze it, I get a little bit out, but it's not dripping, but it's holding together. I got a shape. Does that make sense to you? Yes, I needed more water. You needed more water? All right, I'm gonna keep going. You can follow me, okay? Yep, I hope all of you out there are following along. We're good. And if you need that handout, I know that Monica has posted the link to the handout in the chat. Not more soil, I haven't mixed it all. Thank you. I have Torah and commentary. <laughs> you work in the rabbi's kitchen, you never know what you hear from the Robinson. All right. The first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to take a handful. You can't, you're not going to be able to see this. So I'm going to take a handful. I'm going to put it right over each piece of screen because it's going to hold the screen down. The screen tends to have a little bit of a curve to it. And so by putting it over that piece of screen, I know that that screen is gonna stay in place. And if you only have one hole, you just do it once? Yeah, you okay. just, whatever holes you have, you wanna make sure all the holes are covered. Okay. If the, by the way, you have to have holes in the container. You have to have drainage holes. If you have a container that has no holes, either you need to get somebody to drill it for you or don't use it. All right. Now, the goal here is to fill this container to within about an inch of the top. It's going to fill quickly. Okay. I'm on it. And I'm just, I'm, I'm dropping it in and I'm spreading it out and I'm pushing it down a little bit as I put it in. Nan, we have a question from yes. the audience. They're asking if the window screen that you're using is metal or plastic. Ah, good question. It's just the fiberglass screen. I don't think there's metal screen that anybody uses anymore. Um, but it's the, you know, it's the flexible, I think it's fiberglass. I don't think it's plastic, but it doesn't matter. It's the flexible stuff. How high up do we go? We're going within about an inch of the top. And you want to make it even, but don't worry too, too much at this point, you know, how even it is and how full it is. It doesn't have to be perfect. Can you see this, David? You see that it's about an inch from the top. This is really nice potting uh, uh, cactus and succulent mix because it's so gritty. It feels really gritty. I can feel all of the pieces. It's really chunky. It's just like dough. It's like feeling the flour when you're making challah. Yeah, right? but it's, it's, it's like except you know it feels when the it's opposite. Just right. right, right, right. Except you would never look, you would never feel this and say, oh, that's Kala. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Only if it had chocolate chips in it. <laughs> Do I know anybody who makes chocolate chip Kala? Hmm. <laughs> okay. So I'm going to practice where these are going to go. And you're going to be able to see these now because the soil is so high. I'm going to use these as my center three. We always want to work in odd numbers. Nature works in odd numbers. So even numbers looks kind of funny. Or if you're dealing with something where you want real formality, you go with even numbers. If you want it to look naturalistic, which is our goal today, we're going to go with odd numbers. And I'm going to set those so they're not exactly in the middle. They're going to be set back from the edge just a little bit. And let's see how this is going to look. If I use this one, this one, this one, even though this is long and narrow, it doesn't have to be uniform. So maybe now, Turn it around. Oh, it's, it's dripping out the bottom. That's good. All right, we're okay. No worries. All right, good. They're going to make me clean up when we're done, <laughs> I'm sure. I'm going to have to wash the floor. So this is a little tiny four pack, and these look like little pine trees. 
And I'm thinking I'm going to put them here so that they can go over the side. So we can start pulling them out. Yeah, I'm going to pull them out. I'm just testing at this point. Okay, I'm just see. playing to see how these are going to look. Look at this cute little one. Look at the cute little one. <laughs> I love this that size. is a sedum. That a, is, and it spills, right? It's going to grow. Yeah, spill. Uh, it more makes a mound than spills, but okay. it'll it'll go over the side a little bit. Okay. That this what I'm using is another kind of sedum, and I just want to see how that's going to look. Do I like it? And I want just a pop of color. How do you recommend pulling it out? You squish the sides. They just they just come out. Sometimes. If they if it's tight, yeah, then squish. Just massage the sides. This one's a little bit tight. So massage the sides and then very gently. The thing about succulents is, is the leaves are really easy to damage. So you really want to be very uh, careful in how you handle it. But you could squeeze the sides and then turn it over just like that. I, I really like this combination because I like this sort of blue green, silvery blue green. And then um, I like the texture combination. There's a little bit of pink in here. I want to bring that out. And so I have this one cute little calicoe with a flower. And I might just stick that right there. So I have my, oh, this is going to be pretty, pretty wet here, guys. That's okay. I have my combination. By the way, this is a really heavy pot. Just the pot is really heavy. Um, so if I look like I'm straining, it's because it's heavy and then you put wet potting soil in and it's heavy more. So I really like this combination and um, I think that'll work. So I'm gonna take out, I'm gonna take these out, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna take them out in the order that I had them set so that I don't have to redo the whole combination and remember what I do. Sometimes I take photos of them and then I remake them. And the first things I want to put in are the biggest elements and the ones in the center. Generally, what you do is you work from the center out. That way, again, you don't do as much damage to the plants. Now, these, all I'm going to do is massage the outside and take it out. So there's roots all the way to the bottom. I know that a lot of people are going to be shocked when I do this, but I'm going to break them off. I'm not going to break them all off. I'm just going to take off the ones that are on the outside so I can make this a little shorter. And you can reuse all the soil. And then I'm going to make a hole in the center of the potting soil, a hole that is approximately the diameter and the depth of this root ball. This is the root ball. Because I want the plant to sit just above the edge of the pot. So I'm going to make a hole. Actually, I'm going to sit it high. David, I don't know if you can get close enough. Can you get close enough to show how high this is sitting above the level of the pot? Yeah, one second, one second. Can you see that? So it's sitting high. That's OK. For right now, that's OK. So that one's in place. I'm going to follow suit with the other two that match it. So I'm going to take off the loose stuff on the outside. And to be honest with you, I could take off all the potting soil and just leave the roots and the plant wouldn't miss a beat. Okay, that one's in place and one more. One of the reasons that I work over this bin, by the way, this is a um, called a mortar mixing tray and I get them at the big box store. They're like five bucks and it keeps everything neat and contained. And my husband doesn't yell at me any longer for making a big mess, or at least not quite as much. Okay, so those three are about where I want them to be. And the other plants I'm gonna put in are a little bit smaller. So I'm gonna add some potting soil around these just to fill in the spaces and hold them in place and tuck it in. When I was teaching my kids, who are now big kids, um, how to plant. What I told them is, you want to tuck them into bed. So we want to just tuck it in. 
and I'm adding potting soil as I go along, potting mix. And I'm gonna bring it up almost to the surface. And then you saw me take these little guys out of the pots. Well, let's do these first. And again, these, I'm just gonna squeeze it a little bit and then turn it over and shake it gently. I wanna loosen up the roots because if I don't, the roots will just keep going in a circle. And I'm gonna place these I like having them in the corners. Ah. Here's another one. I'm just pushing it down. They, as long as you don't squish the leaves, they actually can handle a lot of roughing up. You don't have to be too delicate with, with them from the, the root perspective. Okay, I want it to be a little bit higher, so I'm just going to add some more potting soil around it so I can lift it up. And remember the little pink flower? That's going to go in the corner. Are you keeping up with me, Deb? Yeah, I'm right with you. I've got all of them in. I'm packing in my soil. Okay, I'm going to put a little more soil around these. And I'm Do you going to want turn the soil coming all the way up to the lip? Almost to the top. Okay. We just need about a half inch left over at the top. I love succulents. <laughs> I love the textures, the colors. Yeah. So much fun. They're, it really is run, wonderful to work with them. And okay. they work in every situation just about. So and if you live down. on the East Coast or in different climate than us, do, do they not grow year round? Do they go dormant? What happens? Uh, I think there are some cold hardy succulents, but most succulents coming from hot, dry climates, by the way, I asked my friends in Israel, and I was surprised when they told me there are only two kinds of succulents native to Israel. I would thought because it's so hot and dry there that there would be more. But um, there are some cold hardy succulents, but most succulents are more seasonal there. I mean, they just won't survive the winter cold. Interesting, not the heat, it's the winter. No, no, it's the cold. And also if it's too wet, they really wanna be dry most of the time. I'm just, I'm just tucking these in. Now, remember I told you that it's gonna take some time. They'll take them about a month or two to grow in and then it'll be really full. So this is one that I'll take home and I'll put it out in my garden. So all the plants are in. All the plants I'm gonna use on this are in. And I'm gonna finish adding soil and just make sure I'm pressing down around the soil everywhere, I, everywhere you know, all around the plants because I wanna firm it in. The idea is you wanna get rid of any air pockets. The air pockets um, are where, if there's air pockets, any roots that's in an air pocket will desiccate and, and will die. And that will lead to the plant death. There are two ways that you can kill succulents. One is by not firming the soil down enough so that there's air pockets around the succulent roots, which then of course dries them out. And the other way is by drowning them. So if you're a person who likes to put <clears throat> your containers into, into dishes or pots, don't do it. Because when you water, the water sits in that dish and it keeps the roots too wet and more people kill succulents because they drown them than any other way. Now, if I were home, I would take this little cup and let's see if I can do this without making too much of a mess. Ah, go make a mess, it's okay. That's what you say. <laughs> and I'm just gonna sort of rinse off the blades with a little bit of water. And I'm also going to pour it around the succulent, the soil to settle it around, again, around the- uh, I'm using a measuring cup. It's also- That's good. good. It's got a little spot, Dan told me to do it. Yeah. Because it's like got I a little spout on it, right? You know, Debbie said to me, "Aren't you going to bring a watering can?" It's like, no, I'm not going to bring a watering can. Because <laughs> how would you do a watering can with this situation? Because the the no plants idea. are so small. And, and we have a question about about yes. watering them. We have someone in the audience who's asking if you have your succulents outside and if it starts pouring rain, like it was yesterday in San Diego, how do you help your succulents cope with that rain? 
there's, you don't have to. That's exactly what they're waiting for. In that, in that situation, that's when they're going to absorb all the water. It could be all the water they'll use for the rest of the year. So you don't have to worry about that. That's absolutely fine. As long as the pot is not sitting, as long as if they're potted succulents, as long as the pot is not sitting in a bowl or a dish or something like that, it's absolutely fine. Now, when I, after this all dries, I'll brush off all the excess soil from the outside. But the finishing touch on this is a little bit of topper. Thank you. So they, these, a topper can be any kind of inert material. This is um, some kind of lava rock. These are marbles. This is uh, blue and white glass. Here's some other colored glass. This is beautiful. These are really, really beautiful. Um, here's some decorative stones that I picked up. This is rounded pebble. The thing is, whatever you use, I like to use the rounded stuff better than the jagged stuff. And so literally, I am going to take this in this little measuring cup, and I'm very carefully going to cover the entire surface of the soil with these little pebbles. And you'll see that it does a couple of things. And you can get these, these pebbles, by the way, in different color combinations. It's going to finish the surface so you don't see the potting soil. And it also means that when you go to water and you water from above, the, the soil doesn't splash all over the place. It helps keep the pot wet, the potting mix wet longer so you don't have to water as often. If you have cats and your cats like to dig in your pots, this is a really good way to keep the, the cats from digging in. They don't like the way this feels. Um, but also it just makes it look finished. So then you have, you know, it adds to the color contrast, of course, but it makes it look finished. And this small little measuring cup is great for doing this. And this is when I pull out my favorite gardening tool in this situation. When I teach seed starting workshops, I use these to help plant seeds, these chopsticks. But in this situation, what I'm gonna do is use the chopsticks to move the rocks around. And by the way, these are just tiny rounded pebbles. You can get these anywhere at any um, rock supply store and maybe Michael's, you know, places like that. Okay. I'm so excited. This is so good. It looks really good. You did a great <laughs> job. You did a great job. Yay. And you see how, you know, just having a small one is really helpful. Deb, a, a smaller planter is really helpful. Yes. I, I think I for it, the wrong one. No, you, oh, you mean the other pots? Yeah, I have mine oh, are yeah. too tall. Yeah, well, we, we talked about that a few days ago. We, I redirected her enthusiasm. <laughs> so I'm literally using the chopsticks just to tuck them, to get them off the blades, to clear off the blades, and to tuck the little pebbles underneath the plants. What you really don't want is for the plants to be buried either under potting soil or under pebbles. That is not good because that holds, again, too much moisture against the plant. Just about there. Yay. Oh, my. Look so cute, people. <laughs> Can I hold mine up? Go for it. Oh, I'll bring it to Nan. She'll be like, oh, but maybe I need to fix something. But it looks really cute. You know, this is a trial and error situation, <laughs> just like all other plants and gardens. And the other thing is, know that this is not permanent. Plants, these plants, normally, this plant will get this big. So this is not permanent. They'll live here for eh, a couple of years maybe, and then they'll start to look kind of leggy or poopy, and then you pull it out and then you start again. Okay, I have two questions now. Yes. I had one, but no. So if you have plants like this one, which is, you know, it grew out, I pulled it out and there's new life growing and it's been living like this seriously, like on the side of my house for six months to a year. Do I cut it? Bring it to me. Yes, ma'am. <laughs> and then I have a second question. Okay, so the question is, is this worth keeping? No. But there's new growth. There is. Put it in a little pot and grow it up. What I would do is, this is when the, when the cutting, the shears come in. So 
Yeah, we see it. <coughs> Sorry. Okay. Aubrey, oops. Thank you. Okay. I'm going to pull off all the old yeah, well, yucky leaves. See how gentle I'm being? <laughs> <laughs> because I can see there's a little rosette yeah, right so there. And there's one on the other side. And the top is not worth saving. Come on off. So is that worth saving now? Okay, so one of the old pots, one of the little pots that uh, I yeah. used a few minutes ago. Yeah. I'm gonna put some potting soap mix into it. Oh, and then you can just let it grow until it grows. Let it, Yeah. this is how easy it is. Okay. You're done. Thanks. Except you have to firm the soil down yeah, to make I'll sure okay. that. You're done. I wanna right? make sure you have time to finish. So that's one pot we could do. Let's see if we can speed plant one more. While you're speed planning, can I ask my second question? Go ahead. What is it? So if I want to take this and put it in like on top of the soil in the ground, so it's ornamental yes. in the backyard, can I do that? Does it need lifters? Every pot needs to have, be able to drain. So it should be on pot feet. So it shouldn't go directly onto the soil. Right. Okay. Got right. it. Thank you. Okay. I'm doing this real quick. One I'm doing it off camera. I apologize. I'm just putting my soil in. So you can see this, and I want to plant this beautiful aloe. Ooh, look at the roots on that. So I need to make more room for that. I want to plant this beautiful that aloe. That was really good Push for it you. Down. Some aloes, not all aloes. Oh, okay. And then we're going to use this beautiful flapjack plant. I'm not being as careful this time. <laughs> He's going there, and then we're going to take this texture, this is, when is this, a crassula. Oh, one more hint, when you buy these, often it's multiple plants in a pot. So just look at this. These are all, these are just a whole bunch of plants in the pot. So I can oh. just take one pot and I can spread it open, oh, spread it over, around. And, okay, so I don't have the stone in it yet, but you get the idea. You can have this lovely green texture and this aloe, and it's orange, which I love. There's a question. Sure, what's it's the question? Directed to us. How often do you water and do you use distilled water? I do not use distilled water. And it's a really good question, how often to water. With succulents, you wanna stick your finger into the potting soil till you feel the mix about an inch or two down. And once it's dry an inch or two down, that's when you water, not before, not before. If you water before, then it's going to be too wet, and then you're going to kill it. More people kill these things with too much water than with not enough. Let's see. Can we do, do we have time to just add some rock to the surface of this? One minute, David says. One you know, minute. you could add embellishments. You could add um, little pieces of driftwood. You could add some ceramic pieces, you know, little, little glass bits and marbles, anything you want. Um, it's really fun to play around with. And you could even have a succulent planting party. Wouldn't that be fun? That's what we're doing right now. That's exactly what we're doing right now. <laughs> it's more fun doing it with you than it would be doing it by myself. That's right. All right. OK, I added my embellishment. So this one, it needs to be cleaned up. But you get the idea of what that would look like. Oh, Deb. Wow, that's impressive. OK. You Let's taught me have... everything I know. So it's really <laughs> just throwing it right back at you. Every green thumb I have is from Nan's store. Yeah, and you're a great student. So, <laughs> okay, what are the questions? All right. So we have a few questions from the audience. Um, someone's asking, is it okay to spray your succulents with water? There's no reason to because they're not going to take up water through their leaves. The only place they take up water is through the roots. So. I wouldn't spray them because you don't want you don't want to keep them wet anyway. Thank you, Deb. You want them to dry out in between, so don't spray your succulents. Okay, and just as a reminder, if anyone has a question, please put it in the chat to me, Monica Edelman, and I'll be fielding the questions. We have a few others. Okay. Someone is asking if they want to create the vibe of Israel in their yard. What are a few plants that do well in our environment that can also grow in Israel? Okay, so this is interesting. When I was in Israel a couple of years ago, we were traveling, and um, when we got there, thank you, uh, of course, we downloaded Waze, 
and ways opened up only in Hebrew, which meant that my husband had to drive and I had to navigate because he cannot read Hebrew at all and mine is pretty minimal. So um, as I'm sitting in the passenger seat, I started making lists of all the plants that I was seeing that I knew. And it, 90, 99% of the plants that I saw in Israel were plants that we grow here. So, you know, there's the traditional olive tree, you know, all that kind of stuff. But honestly, you see in Israel most of what you see here. How's that for an answer? Or you could do what we did in the, at the Jewish Academy. <laughs> you could make a raised bed in the shape of the state of Israel and then plant that and you could create the sense of Israel in your garden. And do it indigenously by region of what plants grow up in the north and what plants and what plants grow in the south. Right. And throughout. Right. That was okay. I see there are some hands raised. If you can just chat your question, I'd be happy to ask it. We have another question here. Someone's asking, where can they find information about plants that grow best in San Diego? Uh, from me. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> my, um, my latest book is Hot Color Dry Garden. And that is about creating color filled water wise gardens. I have another book called um, uh, Hot Color Dry Garden, I'm mean, sorry, called California Gardener Guide Volume 2. And Debbie it's has really it. good. Look at all those yeah. tabs, people. It's, it's, it's unfortunately, <laughs> unfortunately, that's where every author wants to see that. Unfortunately, it's out of print, but whoops, if that you go paper. on eBay, you can find it. And the other thing you can do is we have a Facebook group called San Diego Gardener. It's more than 12,000 people, and we talk about gardening literally 24-7. Sometimes when we're shooting video, I have to get up at like the crack of dawn and I have to leave the house by five or you know four or five in the morning. And I'll go to my computer to print out the last version of the script. And there's people talking on San Diego Gardens. Like, why aren't you sleeping? But literally we talk about growing plants in San Diego constantly, constantly. It's a great, great site. It's a, it's a wonderful it's a Facebook group. group. Yep. You can we have questions. another question. Someone's asking, how much water should you use when you are watering? Should you use enough to have it drain through the bottom? Absolutely, that's a great question. Every time you water, you need to water sufficiently that the water comes through the hole in the bottom. When I'm watering containers, I will fill them up to the top and then I'll let the water drain out. I'll come back and I'll do it a second time. And that way I know that the water gets all the way through. You have to be really careful when you're dealing with plants that is that are in potting mix because if you let it the mix dry down too much, it gets really hydrophobic, which means it's hard to wet and it pulls away from the sides. So all the water goes down the sides. So you don't want to wait that long, but you you need to make sure that every time you water all of the soil, whether it's this tall pot or this tall pot, they, that all the water gets uh, that all the soil is saturated because the goal of watering is to wet the roots and the roots are throughout that potting soil. That's what you're trying to do, get water to the roots. Thank you. And Sherry is asking, she's planting live with us. She says that she has one plant that lost a whole bunch of leaves when she was working and she doesn't know quite what to do with it. She's showing it on screen. It's, it's a pretty sad looking plant. <laughs> it's lost quite a lot of its leaves. Sherry, show us what's left of the plant. You're on I can't mute. hear you. You're mute, Sherry. She showed her hand and it was just a pile of leaves. Yeah. Well, maybe, maybe, start, it, maybe start that one again. Put it in a pot like I did and let it grow for Sh a few Sherry, months. here's one thing you can do. Take a paper plate, put those leaves on the plate, put it in a windowsill and let it sit. The, the amazing thing for many, many succulents is at the base of the leaf, it will form a new little plant right there. I'm talking a mini, mini, tiny plant will form right there. And it'll suck all the moisture out of the old leaf into the new plant and you'll see roots develop. And then once you see that, you just lay it on top of some potting soil and you have, you have propagated yourself a new plant. It's miraculous. And we have one more question. Someone's asking, how long does it take for succulents to grow for like this to become the size of that aloe? The size of this aloe here? No, the one that you planted in the yellow pot. This one here? Uh, well, it depends on what size you start with, but they're pretty fast growing. You can do that. It'll grow that big probably in a season. So probably in three or four months, it'll get that big. It depends that you can't, there's no generalization. Some are faster growing, some are slower growing, but in general, uh, succulents grow pretty quick. 
Right. Okay. And the same so, principles that I talked about that we did in the container are how you is, is how you think about planting in the ground. Repetition, color combination, texture, tall, wide, uh, horizontal. Those are the same concepts that we use for planting in any garden bed. Thank you, Nan. I'm going to pass it over to Peter Singer now to wrap this all up. Peter, make sure you're unmuted. Aha, uh -huh. how's that? I had a message telling me the host was not letting me unmute. But I want to thank you so much, Monica. As Monica indicated, my name is Peter Singer, and I am the Israel Advocacy and Education Chair on the Jewish National Fund San Diego Board and a proud member of the Eretz Society. Thank you especially to Nan Sturman for your time and expertise in making today's Tubishvat celebration and gardening workshop fun and engaging. Thank you, Debbie Kornberg and the committee members for bringing together all of our 20 plus community partners who participated today. And a big thank you to our San Diego rabbis and educators for your partnership. I hope that you've all enjoyed learning together and getting your hands a little dirty in celebration of Tu B'Shvat. While we're all doing our part to keep our loved ones safe during these trying times, why not plant a tree for those you can't see? You can plant a tree in Israel in honor or memory of someone special by visiting jnf.org forward slash trees. That's jnf.org slash trees. When you plant a tree on Tu B'Shvat or any other day of the year, you're helping to ensure a bright green future for the land of Israel. And for that, we thank you. I wish you all a Tu B'Shvat Sameach. Happy New Year of the trees. Thank you, Peter. Thank you all so much for joining us today. I want to give a special shout out to Nan for joining us. Thank you, Nan, for being here. And a really huge thank you to Monica Edelman, our director here in San Diego, who works the magic behind the scenes, along with Gary and Olivia and Rachel and Dan, you wouldn't believe, and Susan, all the people behind the scenes, and Sharon Joy. Thank you all so much for the work you do. I wish everybody a really happy Sunday. Continue planting. I'm not done. I have more work to do here. And uh, thank you all for being a part of today's Tubishvat program. Boker tov ami, az bon ashir be yachachi, nashir be ahavah.